should divert towards the more unstable knees. So let's go on to see what uh, how to do a TCAR in the neuropathic arthropathy and its sequelae and complications. Yeah. <coughs> so this is the usual scenario which uh, um, the established arthroplasty surgeon would commonly face in his practice. And here, the diagnosis is pretty obvious. It's not a brainer that uh, what the diagnosis would be. If a lady or a gentleman comes to your clinic or outpatient department uh, with such a bad knees and without less pain, then the diagnosis is pretty obvious that this is a neuropathic joint. So diagnosis is usually not a uh, big uh, challenge in such cases. But managing these cases and identifying uh, the problems, anticipated intra-op, post-op is a very important part. Many of the times you uh, may encounter patients developing neuropathy post TKR. So even that is a common scenario that we face now in the post COVID era. And uh, many, uh, even I had equal shares of knee dislocations because of femoral neuropathies post uh, TKR. So uh, if you know them very well prehand, uh, it is very uh, important to know how to manage them. So neuropathic joint or neuropathic arthropathy is also known as Charcot's. And uh, it commonly seen or commonly we, uh, come across is in foot. But m uh, major joints or weight-bearing joints like the knee is also affected. And the joint uh, is seen as a progressive destruction with mark bony destruction uh, with complete resorption at times of the bone. So your bony landmarks are waved off completely. And eventual severe deformity with loss of sensation. So patient is hardly able to stand or walk and will have crippling deformities. Uncertain, so it's idiopathic, but to come to the list, diabetic neuropathy is very common, more than 15 years of diabetes usually. If you are encountering a total knee replacement, always check for two-point discrimination, uh, always check for uh, sensations in the lower limb and joint position and vibration sense. Syphilis is again more common. Idiopathic sensory motor neuropathy is also a very common thing that we are coming across now. As you do more and more EMG NCVs in these patients, you'll come to know that they have severe sensory motor neuropathy. So how to take this is an important task. Syringomyelia to complete the list and lacunar infarcts. Evaluation of such a patient is a very important part. So clinically, usually you'll see a red shiny skin and swollen legs uh, with or without increased temperature. But they may present with trophic ulcers on the plantar aspects of the foot uh, if they are ambulatory and walking. But the definitive diagnosis always is by a synovial biopsy. So usually, uh, interoperatively, you send a biopsy if you're suspecting a neuropathic joint, or if the diagnosis was not that obvious. Clinical assessment is very important. Range of motion, usually, uh, this patient will have full range because it's an unstable joint. So range is not an issue. Uh, quadricep hamstring function is very important. You should always assess the uh, quadriceps power in bedside position and hamstring power in prone position because you want to understand how this neuropathy is going to behave in future. Document the neuropathy by doing EMG and CV test. A clinical tests like tactile discrimination, joint position, vibration tests are important. You also need to know the ambulatory status of the patient because if the patient has not walked for many months or many years, post-operatively suddenly expecting a significant recovery is a challenge, so they need a little extended rehab. Spine assessment is very, very important because pre-existing lumbar canal stenosis also can affect the outcome of your surgery. There are two different types on uh, radiological evaluation, like atrophic and hypertrophic. Usually we see this picture in the knee also. There was a classification by Dr. Mulaji for an unstable knee, which uh, classifies into three different types. One is severe coronal plane instability. Second is coronal and sagittal plane instability. And three is global instability. So the knee is very unstable in all the three directions. Radiological evaluation, carefully study the x-rays. See for your posterior condyle, see for your medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle, if you can identify them preoperatively on the radiograph, because these are the landmarks that you're going to use interoperatively for your gap balancing. Stress radiography can tell you whether it is a stiff knee. Usually it is not. It's an unstable knee. So deformities are usually correctable. So there, there lies the next step of your surgical treatment. So definitely have a detailed dialogue with the patients. Let them understand that this surgery is going to make them a better than their current situation, but definitely not going to make them normal. The expectations are very high. They expect them to walk normally, 
they expect her to behave normally like other people, like other knee replacements do, but this patients certainly would be having some restricted activities, but definitely they can be made to stand and walk and understand the mindset of the patient, which is very important in a neuropathic joint. <coughs> Coming to the principles of TKR, so step by step, first is take minimal bony cuts. I'm going to show you in uh, subsequent slides what that means. So don't take bigger cuts in the beginning. 9 mm standard uh, proximal tibial or the distal femur cut will lead to severe gaps in flexion and extension will lead to managing these patients very difficultly. Uh, do not uh, release the posterior capsule because they usually they have hyperextension or recurvatum. So ex further release of the posterior capsule will lead to further issues. <coughs> At times you'll have to do a, a proximal and a posterior transfer of the medial and the lateral epicondyle. It may be required in severe cases, but if you have not well planned your cuts. Downsizing the components is important. And absolutely no soft tissue releases because it's an unstable knee. So you'll have to balance the knee well in flexion and extension. <coughs> Even if you might to end up with a thicker poly, it doesn't make a difference, but you have to leave this knee in stable situation. If it is left unstable, medial or uh, even in hyperextension, they are bound to fail. Always keep a constraint backup. Constraint uh, implant is the uh, most important aspect in uh, managing a neuropathic joint. <coughs> so usually, these are the problems that will be associated. Uh, there will be lack of the collateral landmarks or uh, there will be reversal of the slope. Usually the balancing depends on your pro primary cuts, the proximal tibial cut and the distal femoral cut. So plan them well in advance. Even if you take a sliver of the bone and you land up with a bone defect, that can be managed separately. So in such cases, very uh, minimum cuts are uh, usually important. Y they may or they may not be associated with extraarticular fractures or extraarticular deformities because of old healed fractures. So a standard resection will land up to a severe gap. So resect very minimal bone from the proximal tibia and the distal femur and <coughs> stay within the soft tissue landmarks. Balancing is very important. Uh, first, the extension gap and then the flexion gap. Once you have achieved this flexion and extension gap well balanced, then rest surgery is very simple. Always aim for mechanical alignment in these cases. We will have a debate, a lot of thing, talks going out the whole day on the kinematic alignment and other uh, alignment strategies, but mechanical axis is the gold standard in such cases because you don't want to leave your components into a bit of virus. Managing bone defects is a different talk, but I just added a slide to show how they can be managed. There can be three types of defect, contained, peripheral, and composite defects. So leave the knee well balanced in extension, have a springy give of two millimeters on varus valgus stress, and it should not open out medially or laterally. This is the case example that I want to show you. It was a bilateral neuropathic joint managed with uh, bilateral total knee replacement. Usually don't aim for bilateral knees, go for stage surgeries one at a time, let them heal well. So usually see the bone, gross bone destructions all around, and this is a very classic. as I told earlier. It's one more case example of a neuropathic joint. You'll see gross destructions. So here the defect is a contained defect, so that's not a big challenge to manage. Left side was operated first, followed by right side. This is a long-term follow-up of this patient. Have constrained implants as a backup. TC3, LCCK, wedges, or hinged processes. They really help to back up uh, your uh, neuropathic joint. Some literature from the uh, literature review that was done shows that these patients have long-term complications. Almost survivorship is 50 to 60 percent. Majority of them land up with complications post-operatively. Aseptic loosening and knee dislocation is the commonest uh, complication. So these are the rare cases should, do not, should not be managed in the beginning of your career. Uh, you should be a little experienced well with your arthroplasty skills so as to manage them. 
and uh, yes these are the cases which everyone would face and should be managed well some literature review slides and just wind up so these patients have complications also i'm not going to go in little bit of details so early and late complications so as we discussed they have a septic loosening which is very common and instability leading to repeated dislocation or subluxation episodes they also have a share of uh, quadriceps tendon rupture which is a very common complication because they tend to buckle down in flexion to so to summarize the treatment is always controversial there will always a uh, when you see such patients there will be a discussion between knee fusion versus knee replacement so fusion also is controversial the fusion rates are very poor almost 30% they go into they do not fuse well and lead to non unions so satisfactory result with arthroplasty have been published in recent literatures constrained knees are important backups post operative complications are very high so adequately counsel them well arthrodesis is a option but it has unacceptable union rates thank you Thank you.